Ryan, great to see you again. Hey, Dan, how are you? Doing good, man. Thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with me and share your story. Yeah, I'm pretty honored to be, I think, your first video guest um, on on more than our, our story. Uh, second video guest. But, ah, uh, okay. Still, I'm still um, flattered. I'm well, still very I'm flattered, flattered as well, buddy. It's been um, <laughs> a long time, um, long time coming. For those of you that don't know, um, Ryan and I were high school uh, buddies, and it's been a long time since we've connected. We had a band, sort of. <laughs> hmm? We kind of had a band even, right? Back oh, we, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so, buddy, just to get right into it, um, you're a serial entrepreneur uh, and, and angel investor. You've got a history of dedicating yourself to causes that improve society and the environment. Would you consider yourself a philanthropist? Um. I mean, maybe I don't. I don't think of myself that way. I would never kind of put, write my title that way. Um, I think of myself as like a, a an impact entrepreneur, I guess, more. And um, I'm interested in solving problems that that matter or that I think you know that I care about. Um, and sometimes the best way to do it is through a for profit vehicle like a company, and other times it's through a non profit. Um, and so sometimes it becomes you're an entrepreneur and sometimes it becomes you're doing philanthropy, I guess. Um, but for me, I'm more just thinking about the outcomes that I'm trying to achieve. Um, and yeah, anyway, philanthropist still uh, for me is one of these kind of old haughty terms of Rockefellers and stuff like that. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I would I don't think I would ever be anywhere close to that kind of league anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so your your most recent efforts include a number of investments in food tech. Um, if you want to tell me about some of these companies that you're partnering with and what they're all about. Sure. So, um, I mean, food tech is I, I've been in, involved in food tech for less than a year, actually, but I've been uh, I've moved pretty fast. And what happened was um, some of the shares that I had in a, in a company that I was operating for a while, um, the company was sold last year and I promised that I would use the money that uh, comes from that strictly for impact investing. Um, and so all of a sudden this kind of happened pretty fast and I had to think about, okay, what's my kind of thesis? And I, do, I work a lot with impact investors um, in Europe where I'm based, I helped a lot of uh, foundations or companies or high net worth individuals think about their their impact investing strategies. So this is about like putting, you know, instead of just giving money away, investing along with your values. Um, and all of a sudden, I, I found myself having to think of my own impact investing strategy and um, and what what matters to me. Um, and so I, you know, started just really whiteboarding some ideas. And um, I, I love new markets. I love uh, environmental um, businesses and I love animals. And um, so a lot of, you know, the, the space that really hit all of that is um, alternative proteins. So this is, you know, if you're familiar with Beyond Burgers or that type of thing, that's the very kind of mainstream side of it that you see in the supermarkets. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of stuff happening in the space and it's, you know, really, really cool. And so I thought I would sl slowly dip my toes into it. And last uh, October, joined the Good Food Institute conference um, and uh, online via Zoom. And I was totally hooked by the excitement in the space, by the values of the people that were in the space and people really, you know, it's very for profit. There's a lot of stuff happening, um, but people really are values aligned on this as well. And so, yeah, my plan was to go slowly, but um, I ended up getting uh, pretty, going pretty fast in the space. And um, this week, I'll close my 17th investment um, in uh, in a food tech company. Um, and these range from like plant-based, which is what most people are familiar with, but then also fermentation, which is um, a, a really big space uh, in, in alternative proteins, and then cultured, which is uh, basically coming from uh, cells being replicated without the animal. Excellent. So you're speaking of animals, What what's the importance we'll use that word of uh removing animals from what we traditionally have as our established food chain 
I mean, it's, you know, if, if you, Boston Consulting Group came up, came out with a study that um, hit the newspapers a few weeks ago showing that investment in plant-based or sort of alternative proteins, like out of ag animal agriculture is the number one way to fight climate change by far. Like, I think it was three times more valuable per dollar spent than the second next one, which was like sustainable cement and then getting down, you know, down, down. Uh, multiples of electric cars and, and that type of thing. So there's the planetary kind of greenhouse gas, um, you know, soil uh, and um, and deforestation arguments. Um, certainly all of that applies to the ocean as well, even probably more so. We don't notice it as much because we don't tend to live on it. Um, but then, of course, there's also, you know, the, the animal welfare side of things. Um, when I worked in, I worked in the mid 2000s in the biogas industry, and I spent a lot of time seeing uh, CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, through to dairy farms with you know lot thirty thousand heads of head of cattle, um, and then spending hundreds of hours on the kill floors of slaughterhouses uh, because that stuff is what goes into a biogas plant, um, and you get kind of a front row seat to see um, what's you know could be improved on in our <laughs> food system, let's put it that way. Absolutely. <laughs> Jeez. Um, what, what, if you had to choose one thing that is really the most promising or exciting thing going on in food tech, what would that be to you personally? One of the companies that I'm involved in here in Vienna actually um, has found a way using fermentation to take CO2 and an ancient uh, microbe called archaea um, and together with hydrogen, turn that into um, all 20 or 21, I forget, amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And so they've actually unlocked a way to. Um, to create carbon negative protein. So wow. that one's pretty amazing. Um, but then I also really like the niche kind of plays. So um, I'm invested in a company in Israel called 4C Foods. The first one that I just mentioned is called um, Archeon Biotechnologies. Um, 4C Foods in Israel, which uh, is creating cultured, so made from cells, eel. And um, what's really interesting about that is something like 95% of the eel population globally has disappeared in the last 40 years. Um, and, you know, we have no idea how eel, eels reproduce. We can't, we can't do this in captivity. Um, eels are extremely mysterious uh, creatures. And um, so even, even if you put aside the, uh, you know, the, the reasons for not catching them wild and, and that type of thing. Um, just in order to still have eel, you know, in, uh, in cuisine, you're going to have to find a solution like this. So it's either going to be plant-based or in this case, cultured. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's a niche market and the, people don't think about it a lot. It's a billion dollars in the U S mostly for sushi, but it's $8 billion in Japan. Right. So it's actually a really kind of large niche market where the, where the wild population is completely disappearing. And so we really have to stop catching it. We really have to let it regenerate. Um, and this is a really, I think, great way to to do it. That's actually, um, that, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, this is, this is the cool thing, right? I mean, I, I get to see all day um, these like decks of these amazing things that are happening. I mean, healthy, chicken nuggets healthy plant-based chicken nuggets can you imagine like what a, what a great world it is if you can eat a chicken nugget and be like this is good for you <laughs> i'm wondering uh do you practice what you preach here uh, what's are you a plant-based eater are you i'm so i'm so 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 i'm vegetarian but i'm not vegan um and uh and i have a cat um and cats are obligate carnivores so <laughs> cats have to eat meat um, I have a dog who uh, was vegetarian for a while, but she has a bit of a sensitive stomach and had to switch off as well. So, you know, it's it's not perfect. Um, I've got a friend uh, who's who's building a really amazing um, cultured uh, pet food company called Because Animals. 
and they make uh, they make cat food out of cultured mouse and uh, and dog food out of cultured rabbit. And so I'm really looking forward to that hitting the shelves and wow. switching them completely to that. So it's still real meat, but you know, without the suffering of of the animals. So is there any areas you're hoping to focus on specifically? The, uh, just alternative protein. So I'll, like it's you know it's still broad, but um, but it's specific enough that I can kind of pick and choose. And I'm placing bets equally on plant based. Um, cultured and fermentation, and I think actually most of the products that we'll see in the future are going to be a combination of those of those three. I'm pretty convinced that you would have, you'll really have to go out of your way to eat a hamburger that comes from a cow 20 years from now, maybe sooner. Speaking of the future, do you where do you see the future of food tech, and where do you hope what do you hope to see um, in the next to use that year number 20 years? I mean, I really think that it's going to be, um, you know, we'll see. It, it's a, a lot of things. I mean, the, the the sector is changing a lot. Food is changing a lot, right? Food hasn't changed fundamentally for quite a long time. But the things that are happening now are, are incredible. Um, we'll start to see. So aside from, you know, my expectation that you'll really have to go out of your way to eat animal flesh that comes from an animal that grown in, in you know, the way that we're, we're used to. But I think we'll see... Um, all kinds of new flavors being developed as well. So this is something that's happening. There aren't actually a whole lot of new flavors that are developed, you know, each decade. But um, as technology, as food technology is changing, the possibilities for this are expanding quite a bit. And I also think that, so right now we see a lot of meat analogs, right? So like I'm big into the like, you know, plant-based schnitzel here in, in <laughs> Vienna, which is <laughs> the plant-based Wiener schnitzel. Um, or, you know, the Beyond Burgers and stuff like that. I love this stuff, right? Because I love burgers and I love chicken wings and all that kind of stuff from the taste. So I'm trying to replicate that. But I think what we'll start to see is moving away from and beyond that and creating all kinds of new products that we can't even imagine right now. And I've you know, been in the room with some pretty cool food technicians and, you know, Stanford uh, PhDs and stuff like that, talking about like, what are we going to eat? Like the biggest challenge is not scientific, it's messaging. It's like, what are we going to call this thing? Or like, how do you describe this taste? Like, you know, what what's what what's the new burger? Like, how do you how do you create a totally new category of food product? So that's um, that's really exciting stuff. I think we'll see like you know menus expand substantially as the world of what's possible becomes much much bigger. Amazing. Um, just to kind of switch gears here a little bit. Um, most of your startups and investments efforts, all all of those things, they really focus either on em bettering people's lives or the environment. What do you get out of this? Like, what's your reward personally? <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, you know, like a reason to wake up every day. Like, I'm. I I think I I need. I think more than maybe a lot of people. I need that purpose, you know, otherwise I get very bored or I get down or like I get, you know, I start getting into my existentialist uh, teen angst uh, phase again and and reach for Camus and Sartre and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I need it like it's it, it's a kick for me and it's um, I like to be able to see how like you can do this, like how you can make these things actually happen. And the more, you know, I've been in kind of more traditional um, non-impact spaces a few times, um, like when I was running this uh, SaaS company for a few years, um, which, you know, where I was doing this basically knowing that the, the money that I make from it, I'm going to put to work this way. But then the work itself and the problems that I was solving, like it was intellectually stimulating a lot of the time. I worked with really great people, but fundamentally, you know, the, I was solving problems that aren't core to what matters to me. And I also don't think we really have that luxury to a great extent now, right? I mean, um, last week it was 40 degrees here. And, you know, in Euro Europe, this has been the hottest summer on record. And next year will be the even hotter summer on record. So um, I think, you know, it's, I, I think it's even harder now to try to you know, do something that that isn't moving the needle, or at least giving giving it a shot on um, on these kinds of parameters. So, continuing on this um, vein, um, you also have a 
a long history with charitable outreach. Um, maybe you can um, talk about CanadaHelps.org and um, really just share with everybody how that came about. Sure. So um, when I was a teenager, um, I had I did some like web development work. Or, I mean, I didn't do it myself, but I, I had a little company that did it. Um, and, uh, you know, we sold it for a little bit of money, nothing, you know, not too much um, around 2000. And um, together with a couple of other, I mean, classmates of ours, actually, right at, at Appleby, um, who are also kind of in this space, we noticed, we kind of noticed this trend that, um, like, hey, we were doing e-commerce stuff. And like, right at the beginning, this is kind of the early days of eBay and everything. And um, there's nothing easier to ship than a charitable donation. And at the same time, um, in Canada, there were 78,000 charities and all of them kind of trying to find a way to get online, you know, for the first time. And it was expensive for them. So this is before the cloud and before Stripe and PayPal and all this kind of stuff, right? And so to set something up, you would have to, you know, invest $10,000 to build a gateway, a payment gateway on your website, and you would, you know, need lots of coding for it. And there would be really high transaction fees and stuff like that. And so we saw the writing on the wall that this is really a pivotal moment that um, we could either, we could intervene and float all boats by creating a charity that does this work for other charities um, or watch as you know uh, these these charities and, and, and Canadians donations get sort of nickeled and dimed to death um, through transaction fees and setup costs and stuff like that. So um, so we built CanadaHelps.org. Um, the three of us, we were sort of 18, 19 at the time, I think, um, and we're able to get uh the canadian banks you know all kind of in the same room together which was amazing to uh support us initially to waive credit card fees initially and stuff like that and really kind of help us to get started um and you know as is often the case there's opportunity in crisis and so when 9 11 hit um basically all of the response money that came to red cross and groups like that came through canada helps and that was really what i think brought us into prime time and um you know today canada helps is still very much the center of um digital giving in canada it is still has maintained its you know charitable uh status forever um it's big now it has uh, over a hundred staff i think um at last count and we've processed something like 2.3 billion dollars um, of charitable money for uh, canadian charities and still growing substantially so it's been a you know a real success story it was um it was hard going early on um this you know the hardest part was convincing people to use their credit cards online in 2000 um it was also really hard to convince the cra uh, the, the canadian revenue agency to um let us put the char charitable information online right it was a level of transparency that didn't quite exist yet um but it was uh, it was the right time and um and it's been i think a big success story for uh, the charitable sector and for um, and for Canada and um, I I always laugh when I'm on a flight an Air Canada flight or something flying back to Canada and once in a while someone in the lounge or on on the plane will mention um, this organization called Canada Helps and uh, the great work that it does and and I should look into it and stuff like that and it's always <laughs> nice to hear that it's gone that mainstream <laughs> one forgets when you've been away for twelve years. <laughs> Um, geez, t tell me a little bit about um, RGL Strategic. I know there's a bit of a charitable component to that too. Sure, RGL Strategic is um, the fancy name for just me. <laughs> it's <laughs> my it's my um, independent consulting uh, work uh, name. It's my volunteering uh, arm name. It's my investment arm. So you know, all basically everything I do, it's just called RGL Strategic. Um, and uh, and it's also kind of the thing I do when I'm not doing something else. So if I'm not, you know, setting up a, a startup or or stepping in on on something, um, it's kind of like what I what I do as a freelancer. And and um, these days it's split. I mean, this year has been an interesting year. 
and it's been sort of split between the uh, the impact investing, the angel investing, um, doing some consulting work. You know, right now I'm working on um, building some uh, uh, plastics recycling capacity in developing countries, um, and then a lot of volunteering uh, for the past four, uh, four or five months, six months now in Ukraine and at the Ukrainian border, um, and uh, helping with the. Yeah, I mean the disaster and the and the invasion that that's um, taken place there. Right, and that's actually the um, the next thing I wanted to touch on. Um, you have been rendering humanitarian aid, and um, we've kind of been following from uh, a distance some of your um, the things you've been doing over there. Um, if you want to give a quick kind of recap, maybe. Um, just let, let people know how how they can help help you help them help everybody. Sure, I mean the you know I I live um, a six hour drive from the Ukrainian border here in Vienna. Um, I was in February. You know I was expecting this to happen. Like uh, I uh, my view on this is that you you know no army or no government is going to put hundreds of thousands of troops lined up at a border and then tell them to retreat because when that happens then they retreat on the powers that be right they that momentum gets um turns on the the regime itself so the only way was for them to go forward um and when it happened on february 24th um i kind of quickly decided to just uh get in touch with some people i know in ukraine or you know in the ukrainian diaspora um and the thing that struck me first is that you know all of a sudden that you you remember the territorial defense force basically was born overnight and all of a sudden um you know everyone's a soldier but they're not equipped for it right and this is still in the winter in the in the ukrainian winter so i went um you know i realized that my car has a trailer hitch <laughs> And I rented a trailer and then I went to um, a few of these like outdoor shops and basically just bought all the camouflage fleeces and all the, you know, hunting boots and camouflage nets and just anything, gloves that could be useful and um, put, you know, piled about $40,000 of it into, um, into this, uh, into my car and the trailer. And then took it to uh, a border crossing station, basically, where I was going straight through to Lviv uh, in Ukraine to be redistributed to the new army, right? I mean, imagine if tomorrow, if everyone in Canada became <laughs> a soldier and how how much equipment you would need, like, right away. So, um, so I started with that. And then, um, uh, you know, a few of my friends from business school and from, our, you know, our school, Appleby and stuff like that, um, kind of caught on and started donating to me um and by them reaching out um you know to help kind of defray the forty thousand bucks or so that i'd spent it started going over that and i was able to do some more missions and um and you know then build quite kind of a you know it's in a strange way this is really like a startup and all the same skills that you have as a startup entrepreneur like it's okay we need to we need a team we need communications we need to figure out like all these kinds of things so we started putting together uh you know spreadsheets with border wait times so we could figure out where to optimize how to cross into uh ukraine most of the work we did was about getting refugees out um and finding them homes temporary or kind of more permanent and as we started getting smarter with that and being able to, instead of just using my car, you know, or like vans, um, we would start getting buses going. And then, you know, I could switch my car, um, which has, you know, it's a station wagon with foldable seats. I got an air mattress and, and set it up and turned it basically into an ambulance and started bringing people who were like, you know, disabled or wounded um, and couldn't go in a bus um, in. And so I was going back and forth to different border uh, uh, posts for, um, for the majority of, of that time, but then also kind of placing money, buying bulletproof vests, you know, doing basically anything where um, helping to set up shelters in, in Hungary and uh, Romania and finding ways um, wherever, you know, a couple thousand bucks could make the, all the difference 
in kind of a group of volunteers, you know, who are, who are totally bootstrapping from their own funding, finding those opportunities, driving around to them and basically seed funding them. So it's like a bit like, it sounds weird, but like angel investing in these things, where can I, you know, where can my 2000 bucks make the most difference? And, you know, in the end, we were able to get, you know, depending on how you want to count it, but definitely thousands of refugees uh, through to safety um, and get tons of medical equipment in. You know, I drove um, uh, uh, a bunch of kind of, you know, high end hospital technology stuff through to, to Western Ukraine um, and just being able to get things donated and, uh, yeah, and I mean, play a role however we can. I'm still very much involved, but these days I can do it uh, much more from a laptop than from a steering wheel. That's incredible. I'm very um, inspired. Um, yeah. <laughs> very courageous too, buddy. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, if anyone's listening and they want to find out how to, to help, the best way is probably to find me on LinkedIn at Ryan Grant Little. So speaking of that, um, you also um, available on LinkedIn. You're very active there. I think you're also, you host an EVPA podcast called Sound Funding that's available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I I, um, I interview, it's it's a bit wonky. It's a bit like, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit nerdy. So I interview the... Um, fund managers of impact investment funds and ask them about you know around the world but mostly in in europe and ask them about their challenges what they're focused on what they're excited about and these kinds of things and so the community it tends to be mostly the impact investing community that that listens to it it's definitely not you know um top 10 on spotify <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm truly honored to um, that you you came and shared your story with uh, with with me. It's um, you're you're an inspiration to a lot of people. Thanks a lot, Dan. I really I really appreciate it. And normally, I'm on your side of this. Like I'm interviewing people, um, and I think this is the first time I've been interviewed about kind of just my life before. And so it's a pretty cool experience, and and I'm pretty honored to be uh, to be uh, on this. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Again, thank you. I appreciate it very much. And um, yep, just you're in. Keep keep up the good work, man. Very inspiring. Also, great to see you again after I don't know twenty years. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Ryan. Have yourself a fantastic day. Thanks a lot, Dan. You too. Bye bye.